Good morning, Good Life family, and welcome to another online service. We are so thankful to see you and so excited for what God has for us today. We are wrapping up a series that we've been in called Picking Up the Pieces, where we've been studying the book of Job together. And we're going to continue doing that in just a moment. But before we do, I also want to just kind of put something that you can begin thinking on and chewing on a little bit. And that is our next series that's starting the following Sunday is going to be called You Asked For It. And part of this series, what we're asking is that we want to know the things that you would love to hear us address. So we're looking for any questions you would have about faith, the Bible, Jesus, how we, you know, relate to society around us. Anything that you'd have a question about that you would want to hear us address. We would love it if you begin thinking now. And if you would, just submit any questions or topic. Email it to us at info at goodlifefl.com info at goodlifefl.com. And that's our next series, but not only could you email us at that email address for the next series, but in general, if you have any questions about our church family or looking to get connected, we invite you to email us there. But let's go back to this Sunday. Let's go back to present where we are. We're closing off the book of Job, but we just want you to know today that as a people, we long to be people that share in the good news of Jesus and share life as well. Now, I know that sharing life looks a little bit different during this season, but you're doing a great step in doing that right now by just being tuned into our online service, by staying connected is the local church. I know it's digital, but as far as I'm concerned, I consider this sharing life. In addition, I would invite you to follow us on Facebook or Instagram are great ways to stay connected throughout the week. And you've already seen the email address. If you have any more questions for us though, I would direct you to our website, goodlifefl.com. Great ways we can share life together. But we are gonna be all about exalting Jesus and sharing in the good news this morning. We're gonna open up with a time of worship, a special um, set that we did out at Riverwalk in downtown Bradenton. This week as the sun is rising, I think it's beautiful. I think you're gonna love it. And we just pray that as we worship together this morning, as we open up the scripture together, our hearts would be united and that we would be focused on Jesus and worshiping Him. So let me invite you in this morning. Let's pray together, and then let's continue sharing life and begin to share in the good news and worship Jesus for who He is and what He's done. So let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you so much for the opportunity to gather today to worship you, to lift high your name, and to say that you are worthy, Jesus, of our praise. God, so I pray for each and every person that's watching this this morning, whether it's on TV or through a computer screen or a phone, wherever it would be, God, that you would unite our hearts and that you would do a supernatural work. Jesus, that your presence would be here, would go before us, and that you would have your way. You have all the glory, all the honor, and we worship you, Jesus. Amen. God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Oh uh-huh. 
Together, church family, sing this truth of who our God is. You are my checks in grace and mercy. There's nowhere we can hide from your love. Your steadfast never fail, you're faithful. All creation is in all of who you are. You're the healer for the sick and the broken track. You are comfort for every heart that mourns. Oh, and our King, our Savior forever. For eternity, we are singing for you done. Can we declare it again? For eternity. We will sing of all you've done. Oh, we sing in God with us, in God for us. Nothing can come against, and no one can stand between us. In God with us, in God for us. Nothing can come against, and no one. Stand between us, oh, and stand between us, oh. And your heart, it moves with compassion. There is life, there is healing in your love. You're the Father. The Son, the Holy Spirit, for eternity we'll sing of all Can we declare He's with us? Oh, we sing, and God with us, and God for us, nothing can come against, and no one can stand between us. Where there was death, He brought life. Where there was death, You brought life, Lord. Where there was fear, You brought courage. When I was afraid, You were with me. And You lifted me up. Oh, You lifted me up. We cleared it. Where there was death, you brought life, the Lord. Yes, you did. There was fear, you brought courage. And when I was afraid, you were with me. Oh, you lifted me up. Oh, you lifted me up. Yes, you lifted me up. Yeah. 
worship you today. We declare and say your love is greater, it's stronger, it's higher, it's deeper. And Jesus, you have your way. You have all the glory. It's in your name. Amen. How would your life change if you were suddenly given a huge sum of money? Maybe you got an inheritance from a relative, or you won the lottery, or Publishers Clearinghouse showed up on your doorstep with one of those huge checks. If all of a sudden you got more money than you'd ever had before, would your life get better or would your life get worse? Let me tell you a story about a guy to maybe help me answer that question. In 1988, there was a man by the name of Bud Post, and he won $16.2 million in the Pennsylvania Lottery. Now, up to that point, Bud, he'd had a rough life. He'd had to fight for everything that he got. He went from job to job, just scraping out a living and even pulling a scam or two. That was, though, until he won the lottery. When he won the lottery, he put that money to work. He received his first of 26 annual payments of about $500,000, and Bud leased a restaurant for his brother and sister. He bought a used car lot for another brother. He even bought himself an airplane, even though he didn't know how to fly one. In the first two weeks, Bud blew through $300,000, and he ended the first year a half a million dollars in debt. So a year later, Bud's estranged from his siblings, and he purchased a mansion to try and get away from them. But Bud's brother was not real happy with the situation, and he wanted some more cash. So Bud's brother hired a hitman to kill Bud, planning to take the inheritance. Now, the hitman failed, and Bud lived on and spent on. In 1996, he sold his mansion for about $65,000, well below its value, and he auctioned off his last 17 lottery payments. It netted him about $2.5 million, but that didn't last long. He bought two homes and three cars, two Harley Davidsons, a luxury camper, and a huge sailboat worth a quarter of a million dollars. When a bill collector came to approach him, Bud fired a shotgun over the man's head and it landed Bud in jail for assault. So once he got out of jail, Bud's bankrupt, he's living on food stamps and a $500 a month disability check. Now there was a moment in Bud's life when he received more than he could ever need. But his life ended up with so much less. In the end, Bud said, I was a lot happier when I was broke. Over the last several weeks, we've walked through the book of Job, looking at a man whose life was shattered into a million pieces by one of history's most painful days. And the pain in Job's life was caused by everything being taken away from him. But is that the only way that life can become painful? It's one of the things we want to look at today. Through Job's life over the last few weeks, we've been wrestling with one big question, that since life is so painful, can God be trusted? Last week, we saw Job demanding an audience with God so that he could get an answer to that very question. And Job got the audience he asked for, but man, he got more than he bargained for. He eventually realized he had no idea what he was asking and that God was so much bigger than he could possibly realize. The Lord shows up in a whirlwind. He takes Job on this lightning fast tour of creation from the vastness of space to the small intimate moments in creation. And God points out, man, I rule and I reign over all of it. And Job really wasn't in the position to even understand the, the, the questions he was asking, nor the answers God could give. 
because Job was not God. And remembering that for him and for us is that first and most important step in picking up the pieces of our painful lives. But we don't have to necessarily walk through Job's exact story to share Job's feelings. We've all experienced some measure of pain, pain that's left us standing in a pile of broken pieces. And while we may not be able to get the answers that we want, hopefully over the last few weeks, we've been able to discover the truth that we need. The truth that God is God and we can trust Him. And last week, we saw that if we ever doubt that, we need only look to something that Job could have never even imagined. That Jesus Christ, the Son of God, took on flesh, lived a sinless life, and He died the death that we deserved. Paying the price for our sins. Making a way for creation to once again have a relationship with the Creator. Now, in those seasons of life where it makes no sense, we can bring all of our questions and all of our pain, and we can leave them at the foot of the cross. But Job, Job didn't know about the cross. And last week's one-sided debate ended without any real relief for Job. He's still penniless. He's still covered in sores from head to toe. And, and those 10 kids of his, they're still dead. Not to mention his three friends who came to comfort him, but really only caused more pain, they're still sitting there too. So how did Job's story end? And what can we learn about our modern times from the ending of this ancient story? Join me in Job chapter 42, the last chapter. Let's look at verse 7. It said, After the Lord had spoken these words to Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, my anger burns against you and against your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. Now, therefore, take seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job and offer up a burnt offering for yourself. And my servant Job shall pray for you, for I will accept his prayer not to deal with you according to your folly. For you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. So Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuite, and Zophar the Namathite, they went and did what the Lord had told them, and the Lord accepted Job's prayer. So here we see the three friends again. We're going to wrap up the story, of that, that part of the story that deals with them, and God is angry with them. Not at Job for asking questions, but at Job's friends for spouting nonsense. God gave Job's three friends an assignment to make it right. They're each to make a sacrifice, to atone for their sinful arrogance and error. And Job, in this pre-Old Testament law, pre-Scripture era, he's supposed to play an important part, playing the role of priest, interceding for them before them to, to, to right their wrongs. But why were Job's friends wrong? We have to unpack that question fully to understand all that it means for our lives in order for us to be able to pick up the pieces of our lives when it starts to fall apart. We've talked about it several times there in this series that Job's friends believe that bad things happen to people who do bad things. But if that's your belief, then by default you also believe that the people who do good things deserve good things from God. You believe that our standing before God and what we receive from God is based on how good or how bad we are. Put simply, Job's friends believed that God gives people what they deserve. Now, they certainly told their friend Job that he must have done something really evil in order to suffer so much. But that belief pours out of a heart that believes they deserve every good thing they get from God. And we see God strongly refuting this ancient argument, giving them those sacrifices that they had to do. But this passage is probably 3,000 years old. And people are still making the same case today. This same belief is alive and well today in the false teaching of the prosperity gospel. The prosperity gospel has been spouting lies in our country and around the world for years. And here's just a few of them. The prosperity gospel says that Christians give in order to gain material compensation from God. If people will give a little to God, then God has to give them even more in return. They also believe that faith is a self-generated spiritual force that leads to prosperity. That faith is something that people conjure up in themselves to get what they want out of God. And they also believe that prayer is a tool to force God to grant prosperity. One of those pastors who does this, Creflo Dollar, writes this. He says, when we pray, believing that we have already received what we are praying, God has no choice but to make our prayers come to pass. It's the key to getting results as a Christian. 
Guys, every one of those points is rubbish, hogwash, lies birthed in the pit of hell. Because the Bible says that God is the sovereign ruler and creator over everything that is seen and unseen. We are his creation, and our purpose is to glorify him and enjoy him forever. Not for Almighty God to be our butler or our genie, ready to jump and fulfill our every wish. And frankly, like if we're the point of this grand cosmic story, this story is not worth telling. Even worse, any belief that puts man at the center of God's story is dangerous and destructive. I believe this false teaching is causing unspeakable damage in our country and around the world, calling people to just enough of Jesus so they can get what they want out of Jesus, or at least be convinced that they can. But what happens next in this section of Job's life? It actually starts to support their claims. They actually used to. Look at verse 10. The Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he prayed for his friends, and the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Then came to him all of his brothers and sisters and all who had known him before, and they ate bread with him in his house. They showed him sympathy, and they comforted him from all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. And each of them gave him a piece of money and a ring of gold. So this story that we've been studying, it began with Job having everything, all the wealth, all the health, all the prosperity that anyone could ever want. In verse 10, we begin to see God's process of restoration, bringing Job back to wholeness. And we see that this restoration is across every spectrum. We talked a lot about how those three friends came to be by Job's side, but only three friends came. He probably had a lot more friends. A lot more people were aware of his struggle. Now, people who used to be in Job's life, who probably stayed away because they didn't know what to say, they started showing up. And they brought with them sympathy. They brought with them comfort. And they brought with them gifts, gifts to help restore their destitute friend. Now, this really is this low moment of peace that we've seen in this long book of turmoil. And yet, like Job has some really deep wounds and some big holes in his life, and God's not done restoring Job. Look at verse 12. And the Lord blessed Job, the latter days of Job, more than his beginning. He had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 female donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters. And he called the name of the first one Jemima, and the name of the second one Keziah, and the name of the third Karen Hapuch. And in all the lands there was no woman No women so beautiful as Job's daughters. And their father gave them an inheritance among their brothers. And after this, Job lived 140 years, and he saw his sons, and his son's sons, four generations. And Job died an old man full of days. So as wealthy and as blessed as Job was at the beginning of the story, God gives him even more. Once his suffering comes to an end, Job ended up with double the number of sheep and camels and oxen and donkeys. And most amazingly, God gives him 10 more children. Now, Job never got back the 10 children that he lost, and I don't mean to diminish that that, that painful loss that he had. But God did restore Job to his pre-pain life, and Job died an old man living 140 years. Now, why did God give Job that double of what he'd had before? Was it compensation for his suffering? Was it God finally giving Job what he deserved? Or was it a prize for passing some sort of elaborate and sadistic test? Truth is, we just don't know. Absolutely no reason is ever given. God just decided to restore everything Job lost and then some. But We do know that the ending of the story is not the first example of the prosperity gospel in action because the point of the book of Job is to call every reader to trust God's wisdom, even and especially when life doesn't make sense. But that may not be the only scenario when we are in danger of turning from God. What if you don't have to believe the prosperity gospel to be harmed by prosperity? Come with me on this. We started this series with a very big question, that since life is painful, can God be trusted? It's a big question that was hard to walk through the answers to that. But I want to finish this series with a different question. The question is this, when life is comfortable, can we be trusted? 
What if for a second, what if the book of Job was just a little bit different? Imagine with me for just a moment that the outpouring of blessings we've seen in today's chapter, in chapter 42, was actually the temptation and the trial in chapter 1. This time, chapter 1, that conversation that happens in heaven, wasn't Satan talking to God about taking away everything from Job? because the pain of loss would cause Job to curse God to his face. No, no, this time, the conversation would be about Job getting more and more and more. And Satan making the case to God that if Job gets enough prosperity, he'll simply ignore God. Now, why is this important? Well, I'll put to you that very few people on this planet or in history will ever walk through the extreme suffering and loss that Job did. But every single day, many if not most of us live under the influence of distracting affluence. And as a result, a lot of times we don't have time for God. We don't have room for God. We simply don't desire God because we've settled for the pursuit of earthly cravings. We've settled, been satisfied with earthly pleasures, and we've poured out our lives chasing earthly treasures. We must understand that we don't have to believe the prosperity gospel to be distracted by American affluence. We live in a more is more culture, and I believe the Bible, though, calls us to a less is more mindset, not from some sort of self-loathing of either real or perceived personal privilege, but from an understanding that anything and everything we have is given by God and should therefore be held with an open hand. Now, please know, I know we're walking through trying times, and I'm not trying to diminish anybody's struggle. I'm not trying to dismiss anyone's pain. But we can't be tricked into believing that heartache is the only thing that can cause us to drift away from God. The pains of life in this broken world can leave us running to God after picking up those broken pieces, but life in a comfortable world can leave us drifting from God, convinced we don't really need Him. By every global and historical metric, an average modern American is ridiculously wealthy. Simply by living here and now, we've all won the Publishers Clearinghouse sweepstakes. Biblically, by virtue of living in this time and in this place, we are outrageously blessed and we are extraordinarily comfortable. But that doesn't mean we're satisfied. A 2020 survey revealed that only a third of Americans are actually satisfied with their lives, not because we aren't trying to find happiness, not because we're not trying to find satisfaction. In fact, we've gone to great lengths to try and purchase it because a typical American household carries an average debt of around $137,000. So in many cases, we've bought things we don't need with money we don't have and settled to living under mountains of debt and we're still not satisfied. Our current culture is the living embodiment of a quote by Charles Spurgeon that says, You say, if I had a little more, I should be satisfied. You make a mistake. If you are not content with what you have, you would not be satisfied if it were doubled. Here's the kicker, guys. Spurgeon said this quote 150 years ago. What do you think he'd say today? And I'll add to that, that if we're not content with what we have, What does it say about our view of the God who gave it to us? We've seen over the last few weeks, we've seen how pain can shatter our lives and what we ought to do in response to that. We've also seen that pain never leaves us neutral, that we'll either run to God for relief or we'll recoil from God in anger. But what if pain, what if pain is not the only force that never leaves us neutral? What if comfort can have the same effect? I don't think we even know how much our culture has programmed us to be driven, to be be governed by the pursuit of more. We think more will make life better, but having more may only succeed in making life more comfortable. The problem with comfort is that it makes us forgetful, forgetful of our fragility, forgetful of our desperate need for God. But instead of pursuing more, and missing God in the process, what if we were content with just enough? Look at Proverbs chapter 30, verse 8. It says, Remove far from me falsehood and lying. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal 
and profane the name of my God. Good life, maybe just maybe, 2020 is one huge, giant, global reminder from God saying, guys, you really do need me and I'm all you need. Your comfort has caused you more damage than any painful storm could do. Your comfort has convinced you that you can survive without me. If God's telling us that, we got to make some changes. Maybe the best way that we can pick up the pieces that we didn't even know were broken is to say, Lord, give me just enough. Give me just my daily bread so I can learn to keep my eyes on you. You know, when I've had the opportunity to travel to other countries on short-term mission trips, I've always been blown away by some of the things that I've seen. Most of my short-term mission trips have been to impoverished areas of the Caribbean. And on those trips, I've always been blown away by their church services. I've been blown away by something that they have that seems to evade us. When they gather for worship and for teaching, when they sing about the greatness of God and the faithfulness of God and the provision of God, they really mean it because they've lived it. In our comfort, in our land of prosperity and excess, we can survive from Sunday to Sunday without ever giving God a second thought. And even if we spend time with God every day in Bible study and in prayer and in worship, For most of us, there's enough food in the refrigerator, there's enough snacks in the cupboard, there's enough gas in the tank, and enough money in the bank. And we know we need God. We're convinced of that. But we we know we can't take our next breath without Him. But only in the painful moments of life do we feel like we need God because we have our comfort to keep us safe. But when I've worshiped with our brothers and sisters around the world and they gather on Sunday morning and they sing songs like, I need thee, oh, I need thee, every hour I need thee, they really mean it because they've lived it that week. They know and they feel and they believe that they've never made it to Sunday unless God made a way. And just as pain can leave us confused, I think comfort can make us forgetful. I'll put to you that comfort's forgetfulness can cause as much spiritual damage as pain's confusion. Comfort can distract our focus. It can derail our purpose. And eventually, it can leave us feeling entitled to not only ongoing, but increasing comfort. And the effects of comfort can creep into every area of our lives. So as we close, I want to walk through some possible signs that comfort has impacted your life. The first one is this. I don't feel the same devotion to God that I did when I first became a Christian. Maybe you're in a position where when you got saved, you felt incredible passion and excitement and freedom. You felt such gratitude for what God had done, and now you couldn't wait to tell people about Him. You couldn't wait to learn more about God. You were so devoted to Him. You just don't feel the same way anymore. I'll put to you that our comfort might distract us from the accomplishments of Christ. How about this one? I don't feel much need or desire to read my Bible. Guys, we have brothers and sisters around the world who would give anything to have the access to the Bible that we do. They will take one page of a Bible and pass it around to their brothers and sisters in persecuted lands, like in their village, so that they can at the time just memorize that page of Scripture. They're hungry for it. We have more translations we could even name available on our phones and tablets with us every moment, let alone what's sitting on shelves, and yet they collect dust because we just don't have a hunger for it because our comfort can keep us safe. Our comfort can keep us at peace. And maybe, just maybe, we've lost a hunger for God's Word. How about this one? I have a hard time believing that my past has been forgiven. When we forget what God has done, when our comfort takes our eyes off of who God is and what He's accomplished, the enemy can begin to whisper in our ears about all the things that we've done before, all the reasons God has to give up on us, and He hasn't. But because we have found our peace and our comfort, we're no longer finding our peace in Christ's completed work on the cross. So we're not too sure we're forgiven anymore. How about this one? My words and actions don't always line up with what I believe about God. That we have a compartment in our lives where we think we have right theology, orthodox thought. That thought's not spilling into everyday behavior because our comfort has caused us to compartmentalize. How about this one? I believe in God, but I can't say my life is prioritized around Him. 
I believe in God, but he's not my highest priority. Well, what is? Well, sometimes it's accumulating more wealth. Sometimes it's climbing the corporate ladder. Sometimes it's making sure that our family and our lives unfold according to our plan. Something is going to be our top priority. We are built for pursuit. but We're created to pursue God. How about this one? My belief in God, uh, but it doesn't do much to stop me from worrying. I, I believe in God, but it doesn't stop me from worrying about what's happening around me. But if we believe rightly about God, we'll know that he's sovereign and nothing comes to us that hasn't come through the filter of his, his hand first. And yet we still worry sometimes. Well, maybe we've grown so dependent upon comfort that anything that would threaten us threatens what's become our idol. How about this one? I don't talk about my faith with other people. This one ties into the rest of them. But if comfort is what we're pursuing, if comfort is what we value, Sharing the good news is probably not going to be high on our list because it is uncomfortable to do so. You risk feeling awkward. You risk having questions you may not feel like you have the answer to. You you risk going, I'm not sure how this person is going to respond. I get that. We get that. We understand that, but it's what we're called to. There's nothing about following Christ that centers around comfort. How about this one? My sense of peace is impacted more by my finances than by my faith. 2020 has really put some large question marks on our finances, both as a nation, and households. Everything's been impacted by it. And I still don't think we know exactly how all that's going to work out. But if, but if our sense of peace is impacted more by our finances than it is by our faith, then maybe comfort has caused us to be forgetful. And how about this one? Lastly, I will do whatever it takes to stay in my comfort zone. Every week we talk about that we are a people who are called to love enough to share the good news and share life. And I will put to you that none of those things happen within our comfort zone. I'll put to you that nothing that Christ calls us to do will actually come from our human comfort zone, protection of our own self-interest. Following Christ means that we take up our cross and follow him. We take up our cross and die daily, that we're willing to suffer with him, that we take him at his word when he says, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart of over whom the world. Our comfort zone is one of the biggest distractions to our obedience zone. Our comfort zone keeps us from being the people God called us to be and living the lives Jesus died for us to live. Good life. Maybe in this season, you've walked through a lot of pain and that pain has caused broken pieces. And I hope that over the last three or four weeks here, you've been able to see that God can be trusted and that our only hope when pain comes in is to bring the broken pieces to God. But I'll also put to you this week that we can have things that are broken in our lives that have nothing to do with pain and loss. We can have things that are broken in our lives that are crushed under the weight of the prosperity that we have in our land. I'm so thankful for it. I'm so thankful to be born in this country. I am so thankful for the freedoms that we have here and for the opportunity we have here. But I will put to you that if we are not careful, our comfort will distract us from Christ. And he is so much more valuable than anything this country or our society or our economy or our jobs or our possessions can ever offer. If anything has taken the place of him in our lives, it is always going to lead to more pain. And no matter how much money we ever get, it will never bring us the peace, the purpose, and the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. At the end of the day, we have to understand that Jesus plus nothing equals everything. That everything we could ever hope for, everything we were designed to need is answered in the person of Jesus Christ. And both pain and comfort can distract us from that. But in the story of Job and in the story of Christ, we can see that he is enough. Good life, do you believe that? And do the people who see your life, would they know it by what they see? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word and for how it challenges us. I thank you for how it speaks into our time, even though it's written in an ancient time. And Lord, I pray you'd give us eyes to see into the corners of our heart today, that you'd have us see exactly any areas of our lives that are distracting us from you, that are causing us to turn away from you because of pain, 
or to be forgetful of you because of comfort. Regardless, Lord, put into us a desire to want you and only you. Put into us a desire to cling to Jesus and nothing else. And put into us a focus to make sure that he is seen through us and that he is our only purpose in life. Lord, if we will do that, we will begin to see our lives impacting other lives. We'll begin to see our peace increasing as we rely on Him. We'll begin to see lives being drawn from the chaos of the world around us to the certainty of who Christ is. But you have chosen us, your church, to be the instrument through which you will reach the world. But that won't happen if we are allowing pain or comfort to distract us from our task. So, Lord, give us a singular focus on the cross, dropping off our pain and pushing aside our comfort to be the people that you've called us to be, to trust you even when life doesn't make sense, and to rely on you even when life, and especially when life, is going well. Lord, help us to be those people so that we can reach the people that you love. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Good Life family, thank you guys so much one more time for being a part of our service today. We love you guys and we truly are honored and thankful that you've joined us again for online service. I just want to remind you that as I know we're kind of transitioning in the season and the social distancing and whatever, who knows what new regulations are gonna come out and we're all kind of monitoring the situation together, but I just wanna remind you that we are having socially distant in-person gatherings again at the venue. If you're thinking for you and your family, you're becoming more comfortable to be a part of that, I would invite you to our website, goodlifefl.com. Right there on the front page, you'll see a spot where you can reserve a seat. Now, normally we wouldn't reserve a seat for church. However, we're asking that you do it in this season just so that we are able to kind of limit the capacity in our room because we've been asked by local officials to do that. So we're making sure that we honor that and also love our neighbors well. So if that's you, then we'd love to invite you to goodlifefl.com to reserve the seat. Otherwise, we'll be right back here online next Sunday at 9.30. And either way, it doesn't matter if it's in person or online, it's gonna be all about Jesus. And we're kicking off a new series that you guys are kind of leading the way in because it's gonna be you asked for it. So it's your questions, it's your topics, the things that you want us to address and talk about. So I'd invite you one more time, if you have a question or a topic or something you want us to discuss or share during a message or a 128 moment, please email us at info at goodlifefl.com. You can also address that with any questions about our church family or who we are, or if you're just looking to get connected or take next steps in your faith and your walk with Christ, we invite you to email us at info at goodlifefl.com. That's all I got for you, Good Life. We just pray that today you would be filled with the love and the joy of Jesus. And as we walk this week, I know today we're gathering to share in the good news and share life, but let's not forget that before next Sunday, we have the opportunity to go out into the world, even if we're just working at home, that we have the opportunity to share in the good news and share life, not just gathering on a Sunday, but being the local church out in our community. So we love you guys, and we cannot wait to see you again right back here next Sunday, either online at 9.30 or in person at the venue at 9.30 and 11. Love you, and we'll see you soon.